and being able to to handle, to deal with the actuality of the performance as opposed to the intention, that you have even from moment to moment, from gesture to gesture, is the art of the performance. That's where the virtuosity aspect comes in. I mean, as far as control in the absolute sense is concerned, if you have total control, that's where it went from the autonomy. I mean, basically, that's where the, you know, the, once you've eliminated the possibility for resistance, or the, or, I mean, it's, what you do is you play with that possibility for resistance. Personally, I deliberately, very deliberately, limit what the puppet can do. Or I sort of build in restrictions. And for, you know, aesthetic reasons, I decide that although it would be nice if the head could move up and down, I will not allow it to do so. And I sculpt the head into a fixed position, which forces me then to compensate for those kinds of movements with, like, the movement of the chest or the shoulders, for example. So, you know, this is an example of the kind, and or I often work with very, very basic materials. Like, you know, I just did a production in California using the Southwest American Indian Kachina dolls as a model. And the Kachinas have no articulations, which was fascinating, because we were working with figures that had no potential for expressivity in the, you know, mimic sense, you know, mimetic sense. And so we were working with that limitation. And, of course, the result was much more poetic than had we made little, you know, totally automaton figures. However, I have seen, for example, there's a British puppeteer that I've seen recently in Stockholm who built in some little motors into the figures so that when he places them, you know, they still continue to quiver a little. And it's very beautiful, you know, because they're, you know, the movie, it's like birds, you know. And there's, the risk is that at certain moments it becomes too regular and too repetitive and you recognize that it's a mechanism. But the desire to incorporate something that has that kind of control built into it is still interesting. I think we have another two, but we're going to have to really, I will take them now really quickly or we could save them for the later discussion while we develop them a bit more. I think it might be better if we close now because we're going to have time problems afterwards with people having to race off to rehearse with the symphony. So if you don't mind, if we can hold them for the next session. And so we'll break for 20 minutes and then come back and we'll have a last minute brainstorm together. And thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Kun je dat voor de plan zo staan? Ja, dat krijg je alleen niet koud. Ja, dat krijg je alleen niet koud. Ja, dat krijg je alleen niet koud. Ja, je hoort het van de grond van de dingen. Ik heb nu laag. Maar ik krijg hem niet koud. Nou, gisteren was het kouder. Ja, maar ik krijg het niet koud. Hoe lang begint het? Ja, dat is het. Ik weet het. Ik kan hem nu even hoog zetten. Je moet niet. Ik moet hoog zetten en afstaan. Heel veel hoor. Nou, ik heb nu de paar uit en dan schilt dat. Ja, dat schilt nu 6 kilo wat. Ja, weet je dat het gewoon is dan? Oké. Met dit soort situaties, hè? Dat is helemaal geen probleem. Dan moet je, dan moet je in principe gewoon gaan koelen. Dat kan. Maar als je gaat koelen, ja, dat maakt je hier klik. Ik heb ook met Peter Peterijnen geweld, dan moet ik kast om die klep heen komen. Ja. Want eigenlijk moeten we nu koelen kunnen gebruiken. Ja. Als je dat kan gebruiken, dan ja, hou je het ook 20 graden in. Ik heb gekeken al, hij zit op 24,5 graden. Dat meet hij daar. Kijk, beneden zit het op die opnemer. Ja. Het was maandag 28,5. Ja, dat is het. Maar dat is het absoluut niet. Nee, het is oké. Maar ik heb nu de paar uitgedaan. Dus ik denk dat het ook wel een verbetering is. Ja, kijk dan. Daar komt dus, ik, ik heb die... Uh, ik heb de verwarming er weer uit. Ik heb het dichtgezet zodat er geen warme lucht meer door die nee. Maar dan komt die koel, dan komt er weer heen. En het gaat veel in die warme lampen. Het wordt toch weer opgewarmd in de lucht. Dat is het probleem. Ja, ja. Ja. Dat valt bijna niet tegen. Ja, koel. En de hartstikke. Ja, die, 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 die zit daarachter. Oh. Ja, of die, die kan ik ook op hoog stukken. En die mag dat wel een En die hoor je dan ook weer. Hoor je dat? Zo ja. Ja. Ja, maar in ieder geval, uh, ik laat hem wel zo uh, laag staan. Ik heb in ieder geval geen geluid over laten maken.
the original idea is we shall have a nice sort of manifesto. We call it the effects of ridiculousness. We're all so different. We're all so... Uh, it's, that's what's been so exciting for me to see that, that we have so much in common, and yet we take absolutely opposite points of view. It's very interesting. Base everything on my sense experience. And pleasure being very clear, a purely divine sense experience, I can use that for making most of my musical decisions. I feel very grounded that way. And, and it's not that I don't use reason, but it's just that I have less time. Because it leads me off into the nerdy things which people don't like to listen to. So if I like it, the pleasure from it, and I feel safe. So this, this is the reason I think touch is important, because I've gotten pleasure out of making music that way. The other one, the one technical about which is, is that touch is important as a way of grounding art in general because it may be essential for our survival, maybe part of what we're doing as shamanistic or whatever artists is keep people in touch with some you know, more important reality. And uh, so that, that just, that was, maybe that maybe I should just stop. That's something that's cool. 
uh, whatever people say about non-linear thinking and hypertext, I'm sorry, those people who are spinning the hypertext stories live and die like all the rest of us. Um, but what is interesting about these tools that we're starting to develop that allow us to invert and revert um, this, this causality, these time processes, um, this I think also is, is a very powerful uh, um, moment for, for artistic creation. So I'm, I'm really interested in that. And I think that um, this non-human uh, issue, these machines that we're creating and the things that they are creating, um, we are designing them often for um, um, instrumental purposes to achieve uh, specific goals. These are machines that are being designed to weave their ways into the fabric of our technical society. They're being designed to accomplish tasks. But these same machines, because basically as artists we're deviants, um, we're trying to make them speak in other tongues to plagiarize somebody. We're trying to make them speak poetically. And I think this is where we have to really think twice um, about this issue of non-human perception. Um, you can say, to what extent can non-human activity be meaningful for humans? Uh, if electricity is, well, I guess it's human activity, it's running around our bodies all the time, but mastered electricity, as Dick Rymer has described it, is something that's been exteriorized in process, as a process at a scale of which we'll never be capable in our bodily forms. Um, so we can see that electricity represents immense uh, usefulness and effectiveness within human society. But then it's, it's meaningful as an instrumental system, as an effective system. But how do we make it poetically meaningful? And this is the real question. And when we're caught up in technologies that are, um, that are emerging and evolving incredibly fast, um, we are in kind of a, um, in this stunned, uh, dazzle effect um, system to a certain extent. We're inventing machines that are doing such stunning things, even if this is extremely momentary, because as everybody's been pointing out, the machines are going to be obsolete before the dazzle is worn off. Um, this again uh, means that we have to stop and think about what kinds of poetic meanings we would like to generate from these machines and what type of poetic interactions and poetic discourses we want to set up with these machines as partners, <coughs> as counterparts. So, so that was a, I don't know whether I'm being very clear, but um, too bad. Um, so the, the body is an instrument when we uh, purge it of its subjectivity. Was, there was indeed a very interesting uh, um, discussion between Barbara and, and Trevor. Um, do you consider yourself as uh, conveying and uh, representing and incarnating your subjectivity when you treat your voice as sound material? <coughs> and Trevor has this kind of bifocal view on it, uh, which is, of course, my subjectivity is an intrinsic part of the voice I'm using at the same time. I'm using this in a detached fashion as a sculpture of this material. So um, I, I think that the body and the instrumentality of the body, uh, purged of its subjectivity, uh, is something that we can line up to a certain extent as an ideal. But then, and the Taylorist body, of course, purged of subjectivity, is a perfectly integrated mechanical effector in a mechanized society with its mechanized productionist and chauvinist. But um, this Taylorist, um, mechanics, if we're going to get anything aesthetic out of it, um, it has to be used the way Meyerhold used it. It has to be used with, with the grist of human subjectivity kind of coming through it and, 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 and making it something slightly kinky, um, slightly anti-alias in it. So I, I think this, um, how much humanness, how we have to dose this, uh, this mix, this machinic mix, um, so that it is still artful is the real question that we're, that we're posing today. Um, how much humanness or humaneness do we have to retain within the systems that we're building or within the nature of the dialogue that we're building with these systems uh, for them to be appropriate vehicles for poetic expression? I think that's a, that's a real, for me that's a real good one.
And, and there's another one that just kind of cropped up, um, but it's, uh, it's maybe been buzzing in the background for me for a long time, which is um, I, I have this um, way of approaching uh, performing arts uh, as being in themselves a, a form of defiance of normal uh, locomotor activity. And that sounds a bit clinical, but um, I did quite a lot of work on circus history, and it's really amazing when you look at the origins of many of the early circus forms, which are really um, one of the originally forms of theatre, and um, also the other forms of religious theatre that we see coming through the, through the Greek arena. But what's interesting in the old circus terminology is when you go into the etymology of this stuff, the number of different verbs that are used to describe how people walk. Um, acrobats are people who walk on their extremities. And then you have neurobats, uh, neuro meaning rope. Rope walkers are neurobats. And then you have um, oribats, or oris meaning mountain, which is where oracle comes from. But the oribats were people who could kind of do what ninjas do on 20th century film. And, and you have all these incredible terms for these people who defied normal locomotor activity. And this was their art. And they were considered as being simultaneously gods and devils because they were doing abnormal, inhuman, superhuman things. And I'm wondering to what extent the gesture of virtuosity that we're talking about, this um, uh, not irrational, but <laughs> this uncanny, I love that word, this uncanny control of time um, is perhaps in the, way, in, in the same realm as, as this um, uh, abnormal, this, this defiant activity. We're, we're defying normal systems of control. What fascinates me with a juggler is that a juggler is establishing uh, a spatial realm uh, where he is defying that everything that we think we can feasibly do and we can feasibly expect to be done. And this is a moment of, of, of suspension of belief in all of these damned rules that keep our feet on the ground. And I think this is why um, the juggler constantly has to throw higher. And this is why, of course, we're easy targets for the people who are going to be shooting us while we're watching the ball go up to the ceiling. But um, I, I think that these issues of what constitutes normal locomotor activity, and, and locomotor is too narrow a word, this would have to be extended. It's, it's, it's an activity that allows incredibly fine control of time processes. Um, for me, that's, that's one of the essences of, of the artwork that we're talking about. I guess, um, I guess I should stop there. I, I had written something, but I don't know what to say about it. I'll just throw it at you, and then maybe you say something like it. It was just a phrase, erotics of distance. Um, I don't know what the hell to do with that, but um, actually, I, I do know where it came from. There was a a very interesting web forum earlier this year, some of you have followed the Ivy, and it was a mix of textual, purely textual input, uh, far from touch, that was happening over an intensive period of three or four months. And there were amalgamated uh, group, collectively written discourses that were just kind of emerging through this incredibly intense conversation process. It was one of the rare forums I followed that actually implicated people from not just uh, North America and Europe. And so there were people, a lot of people in the Southern Hemisphere from South America, not many from Africa, but there were a few contributions. But there were people sufficiently scattered around the planet for there to be constant input to this forum. And uh, it was also being moderated around the clock. Uh, so there was constantly stuff being built up and there were some very interesting moments where uh, there was one woman called Yvonne de Laramé, who's a, an amazing New York woman artist, who, who did a kind of a, a spoof on Bart's uh, fragments of a lover's discourse that Barbara referred to the other day. She, she twisted it, she pulled out bits of the Bart text and worked in some of her own literary erotica. And the next thing that happened was that some other reader contributed to this forum, 20,000 kilometers away, jumped on the text and laced it 
with his own erotica. And it was absolutely, it was incredible. It was very powerful stuff. This was purely textual. It was incredibly, I don't know the English word, but il y avait beaucoup de pudeur. Absolument. And it was, it was just one of the most powerful pieces of uh, erotic discourse. I mean, what was interesting was that, okay, this is the stuff that used to happen um, when the courtly ambassadors took these wonderful Chinese uh, women's writings uh, to their various councils and so on, but this was happening in real time, practically. And, and it seemed to me that there was a kind of an erotics inherent to the communication systems and the speed of the communication systems that we were using um, that was a little bit but um, I'll let you show that. <laughs> yeah, let's hit it off with uh, personal <laughs> uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I think I would like to present a, a, a little case story. And here is uh, where I end the abstraction is right away. Um, the case story is uh, a story about my father and me, and it's a survival theme. He came from the war, he was a radio amateur, he was a convinced socialist, and he, he didn't have all the time to raise uh, his kids. So, and, and there was opinions about that the kids shouldn't speak, you know, when all the grown-ups were talking. So the combination of having electronics in the house, like shortwave receivers, and not being able uh, to, you know, uh, have a normal relationship with your parents, like yeah, being able to talk and develop talking, made, uh, made me angry and also made me not want to talk at all. And so the only thing that was left was the possibility of uh, maybe uh, secretly trying his uh, receivers and tuning in to what was then the shortwave, which was then filled with all these telex noises and uh, and very funny zooms, and, and he actually also forbid my brother and me to play with it. And um, we had a good time uh, in our rooms because we started hiding ourselves there when we were sent there because we had done something bad. And uh, we, we happily were doing some things bad to be sent to that room and be locked up. And uh, there, was, there were very nice moments when, uh, probably when I was about four years old, when he was sitting on his knee, the classical thing, but in, not in front of a fireplace or something, but in front of his shortwave receiver. He was trying to answer our questions like, what, what is this, what we hear? And he said it's coming from very far. And our notion of far was outside of the house at that time. And uh, we couldn't go there uh, unattended. So later, uh, when we later explained this, so we came behind the factory that was opposite our house. So when we finally had the age that we could walk ourselves, we discovered that the sounds uh, weren't there at all. It sounded completely different. So one thing is that I'm still looking for, uh, for where they come from. <laughs> and, and on the short way, they have uh, uh, disappeared. Now, the survival aspect is, is uh, you know, he, he was pretty tough on me and, and, and my brother. And uh, so the only thing we could do is just be completely silent and, and, and for a long time. And, and the only way we could do later is to steal his equipment and, and so, you know, to, to play with it in our room secretly again. And it was forbidden. Well, it was accepted a little bit, but then it was forbidden to play with it when, when we went to go to bed, which, of course, we, we slept for uh, so-called for half an hour. And then we would turn them on again. And very often we would fall asleep with these zooms. So, uh, electronics for me is not something, you know, that I've chosen, uh, uh, you know, to, to, for an artistic reason or something. It has been there all the time. There was a kind of magic in what the signals would bring, but there wasn't magic in, in what we were doing with it. You know, we were opening them up, get shocked, uh, connect wires to other houses where your friends were, you know, like, it, it was just a normal thing. And, Maybe because of all those sounds in the night, because sometimes you would wake up, wake up because the sounds change, uh, uh, you would, uh, um, it, it might have created a world of sounds without me knowing about it. And I'm not even searching that hard because these sounds are still around in my head all the time. Now at some point, uh, I really had to leave home because it was unbearable. And so I had to uh, leave school and, and not, finish this whole education that I was prepared for, you know, like go to the technical university in Delhi and all that stuff. So this was like a disaster. And it was also a nice escape. 
So I found myself, oh, I must tell also that they gave me piano lessons, but it was given by the person who played the, the carol in the bell. And he played so terribly loud that I was really scared. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, it, and uh, so that stopped. And later, on the way out of the house, I, I picked up uh, Ehlers Bell's uh, <coughs> record. And, and I, that was really the sound I loved. And, and, and that was a language that I, I understood. And, uh, and uh, so I, I, I loved, there was a way to get a trombone. I still thought, well, maybe I should try an instrument then. And through the, the factory's harmony band or marching band, uh, the, I had to play a little role for about a year in that band. I could get a trombone. Of course, I never made it through the second or the third uh, trombone. <coughs> It was not a failure, and, um, but I got the trombone, so I remember the day that I walked out of the house with the trombone, which I couldn't really play, and, uh, and, and uh, it felt like, oh, now I'm a musician, you know, so that it had something. So even there, it wasn't like a choice, you know, it was not just, I want to be an artist or something, it was just the only thing that I, I could hang on to. Now, uh, then there's this long uh, uh, line of survival moments where, where okay, yeah, so I played from bones, so I started to go to a, a very uh, uh, almost aristocratic student club where, where they were playing Dixieland. And of course, I was kicked out of there because I didn't play the styles right. And so, <laughs> you know, they, so that sort of put me back. Uh, at some point, I went back home, and, and my brother and I, were living in the basement, not talking very much, but playing for hours with little records, you know, scratching them, uh, like like uh, completely dismantling the piano, sticking needles in it, using guitar elements to make sound. And we were just playing for days and having more fights with our parents. So at some point, I really had to leave. And uh, uh, then, uh, you know, if, if you don't want to talk too much, you don't read that much, and you don't think too much about systems. So the only way to deal with this electronics is to touch it. And gradually, I, of course, wanted to make it, turn it into a kind of music, because we, we found out that by playing, you could really play well together. So my brother and I started doing concerts, and later I had met a drummer. And, well, okay, so I can go on with this whole story uh, for a long time. Gradually, I, I discovered that there were people living as artists, and, and like there was Dick Reimer, who run the electronic music to the observatory. And he literally let me into the back door of the studio, and, and I could say he was my mentor uh, in the best way I have experienced any mentor by not wishing to refuse any question that I had and telling me that I should find out myself. And he gave me all the possibilities to work, and then I started, you know, breaking open the Moog synthesizer that was there, finding out that if you stick your fingers inside, you can really play the electrics by, by being a part of that, that machine because you become a wire yourself uh, because our skin can conduct electricity while the rest is well, but your skin does it first. And sometimes you have a real nice tension because of the shocks you get. And then other moments you can modify the circuitry by touching it and, and modifying the the, the, the whole way it works. And so you have like connection and you have control and you are part of the instrument. And so I love this analog technology. Now the result of that was the tracker boxes that you find here in the hall that were really designed as such instrument that you can just touch and play. You don't have to know. And um, so later, the, the more instruments start to build and suddenly you, you, you find out that you can survive by by becoming a composer and by even trying to contribute to a little institute and, and, and so forth. Now, I'm, I'm telling this story because uh, it shows, uh, like, like a lot of uh, other people that have been telling about their fight with the electronics in a way, especially Leticia has been very clear about it, that, you know, it, it's all a matter of survival. Need. You know, when you start a concert, uh, um, Francis and I have a plan for tomorrow evening, but you know we didn't have the time to really fill it in. But we also manipulate ourselves in a situation that we don't have time to, do. and we are sort of happy to deal with it because we all both have our own little survival methods, and those survival methods has also to do with what do you tell the other people around. I mean, how do I make money in, in telling stories or making music or uh, or finding friends or lovers?